Um, so yeah, you get to Christmas, you get to the end of Christmas and you find yourself thinking, oh, you know, it was a lot of trouble, wasn't it? It, was, it took a lot of getting there. And you got there, and what was that about? Boxing Day's a bad one. Um, you know, what happens on Boxing Day is that, well, uh, yeah. and then you go back to work, perhaps after Boxing Day, depending on how the days fall, according to the dates. You go back and say, good Christmas? You know, oh, great, yeah, it's good, excellent. And people say, do you find people saying, um, oh, quiet, you know, you know what quiet means, don't you? It's rubbish. <laughs> That's what they mean. They say quiet and they mean disappointing. Yeah. Quiet, disappointing. And I was just thinking about this the other day, walking the dogs the way you do. And uh, I just thought, you know, those are words that really shouldn't be associated with what Christmas is about at all. Quiet, meaning disappointing. What was it about? Does it matter? John 118, put it on the screen, gives us a really good insight into what it was all about. John is summing up his prologue. And we've said before, the prologue to John's Gospel is like the preface, because it actually gives you the main things that he's going to say throughout the rest of John's Gospel. And if, if you haven't been through John's Gospel recently, it's always worth a go. You know, It's worth a good run through. It won't take you long. Uh, and David Suchet has now recorded it all and does it brilliantly online. Yeah, BibleGateway.com, click, David Suchet, there he is, giving it all he's got. Uh, Poirot reading, you know, the New Testament, it's fantastic. Uh, it's really good. John 1.18 gives us the summary of that prologue. It sums it up and gives us a good answer to what is this about. This, the word became flesh stuff. What is it about? No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. What it celebrates, okay, it might be in the wrong way, sometimes, quite often, might be at the wrong time of year, almost definitely is. Jesus was probably born at Easter, but just don't worry too much about that. Um, that's almost definitely the case. Um, what it celebrates is Jesus coming to earth in order to make God and all that God is about to be known. Known in terms of facts, but also to make him known personally. And we're looking at John 1.18 on this, and, and yes, it does matter, because also today, what this unveils to us is really the solution to the source of one of the biggest problems we encounter with living and with the Christian life in particular, but probably also with life at all. We're dealing with a big thing, the lack of which saps the life out of us, and the thing without which our crises to become the most unreachable of challenges. We're dealing with how we know God. It's not so much the understanding of what's going on when we've got a difficult circumstance. Forgive me, it's not usually the difficulty of the circumstances themselves either. And if you're having a difficult set of circumstances, that's not necessarily a nice thing to say. But really, trust me for a minute, it's not necessarily the difficulty of the circumstances that makes it particularly hard. It's usually much more the difficulty that we cannot say we've found him, known him, and walked with him through the circumstances that we are encountering. So much of our difficulty arises through not knowing God and having him with us, helping us through it. And sometimes you're going through something and you're thinking, if only I had a buddy there, if only there was somebody I could really be leaning on and talking to about this one, and actually, well that's where we need to be going with this. Several distinct propositions in this verse, Caleb. Firstly, no one has ever seen God. <coughs> what it's actually saying is more like this. Um, that noun God there is, is, it's got no article in the Greek text. It's not the, the, the God, right? Or it is deity. No one's ever seen the essence of what God is about. No one's ever seen the essence of deity. That might be a better translation, deity. It's important to remember that when it comes to the appearances of God in the Old Testament. Um, but look, this, no one has ever seen God. First of all, it's a pretty significant problem for people who don't have faith. If you're living by sight, not by faith, and you can't see God, who are we talking about? Because, do, do you see what I mean? You know, there, really. If you're living uh, as, as a materialist would, or a person who lives just for this time, that lives by sight lives, um, then, then here's the problem. 
because your criteria for truth are the things I can see and touch and taste and kick and chuck a brick at, yeah? Those sorts of things. Now, if a person doesn't perceive spiritual truth on account of not being spiritually there kind of thing, then they are still in the position of the person whose natural vision can't pick up x-rays. Or the, the person who, who can't see the, the, the light, uh, can't see infrared light till it falls on something. Do you see? And you need a spectroscope, like that thing they just stuck in space and they're showing pictures. Have you seen those pictures in the news on the technology page on BBC recently? They got these pictures of the x-ray uh, sort of uh, emissions from the sun coming up at the moment. Spectacular, great thing to look at, but they got a spectroscope in space, some fancy bit of kit, and it's now sending back those pictures. We can't see that unless we've got the kit to see it, unless we can pick up the data that is there and acknowledge that that is evidence of, of reality. Now you, you can't see an electrical current. You can't see love. You can't see cash flow, but you, you know when it's happened, right? Because this is, we're heading into January, yeah? Um, but that doesn't mean it's not there. So it's an absolute problem for many people without faith who can't see God. It's a problem for some believers, some theologians too. Um, because there are times in the Old Testament when people seem to see God. That's important because they don't see the essence of God in the sense it's intended here. So there's the incident in the Old Testament where Moses was allowed to hide in the cleft in the rock as God's glory passed by. Yeah? John 1.14 just said, we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yeah? And it seems to be an allusion back to Moses um, having seen God's glory pass by but couldn't look couldn't see the essence of God but knew there was something there. Do you, do you know what I mean? Um, Bruce, F.F. Bruce, famous Old Testament scholar from times, a New Testament scholar from times gone by, he says we should perhaps say that Moses saw, so to speak, the afterglow of the divine glory. But he couldn't see that essence, which is what John is on about here. And in that diminished sense, God speaks with Moses face to face, but without the face. And Moses sees the form of the Lord, Numbers 12, 8, but doesn't see him. Isaiah 6, the prophet cries out in anguish because he thinks his eyes, yeah, his eyes, yeah, go on. There you go. And on down. And again. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah says, woe to me, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, I live among the people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. But then you read the account and you see, what has he seen? The hem of his robe filled the temple. So if the hem of his robe fills the temple and has this effect on Moses, then um, Moses hasn't seen his face because Moses is in the temple and it's the hem of his robe that fills the... Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's not the essence of deity, it's not even the face of God that these guys have seen. So. Carson. The fact remains, the consistent Old Testament assumption is that God cannot be seen, or more precisely, that for a sinful human being to see him would bring death, and he gives a set of quotes. Apparent exceptions are always qualified in some way. No one has seen God, except there's one, himself God, who has expounded God and made God known to us. And he's the one that John is talking about in this prologue to John's Gospel. The Word made flesh. The one who's at the Father's side has broken the barrier that made it impossible, even dangerous, for human beings to see God. And by Christ's coming, what he has done is made God known. How do we know he's come? Well, there are the, thanks, Caleb. There are the contemporary accounts. We know secular accounts of Jesus and that he was there and he was about. Yeah, we know those things. He, he's for real. Then you've got the gospel accounts of the eyewitnesses, and John is himself writing pretty close to the time. I mean, within the lifetime of people who then lived of Jesus himself, and we have evidence of that. We've got documents that, that give us that. Ryland's Library. Uh, is that your way, isn't it? John Ryland's Liverpool way, isn't it? It's not a million miles from where you're from. So the documents are there showing us, yet yeah, Jesus is a real uh, thing. Um, hmm, what do I mean? That's not what I mean, is it? A real thing. You know, he's the real thing. Um, do you remember those Coke things? 
<laughs> Coke, it's a real thing. Somebody got hold of one of those and they put, instead of Coke, they put Jesus Christ in the same font, yeah? Jesus Christ is the real thing. Well, there you are. He is. Contemporary accounts, gospel accounts, we've got it. And John is going to go on to tell us all about him. All we need to know about him, that is, and he, he specifically says that, it's what we need to know, in order to know him and believe, and by believing to have life in his name. John is concerned with who the Jesus who came is. He's got plenty of good evidence that he did. But who is he? And what's he about? And what's the significance? Caleb, thanks. Oh, uh, mm, yeah, go on. No, Monogenes Theos. Well, he was the one and only God uh, who was being. He's in his being, he was in the bosom of the Father. Um, him and, and, and exegeting him to the world. We'll come to that word in a minute. Go on in. Uh, yeah, okay, God the one and only, right? God the, the Son. If he's the only begotten of the Father, it doesn't mean that he was created out of God. It means this is the relationship in which he stood to the Father. It's not like when the, jo the Joey's come and knock your door, the Jehovah's Witnesses come around and knock your door, and they're, they're Arians, technically. They follow the teaching of one Arius, who was an early church, Calvary type bloke, heretic, uh, who said that there was God and then God made the Son, and you know, it was all like that. Not that. He is of the same substance as the Father. And monogamous means he is um, the only member of a kin or kind. He's unique, but he's part of, you know, he's of, generated out of the one. God the one and only. Yeah, what else you got? The Son, in closest fellowship with the Father. You get this expression, lie, lying in the bosom of somebody, which is weird to us. But in, in sort of the Middle East, guys are close to one another quite normally and naturally, it's not a problem. Uh, and we presume it was the same in, in Jesus' time for some reason. And uh, we know that they used to recline at table, the first century Judaism, they'd, they'd be lying down around the table. You've got the picture at um, in, in the account of Lazarus, you know, the rich man and Lazarus in that parable? Um, it says that Lazarus died and went to be in Abraham's bosom, in closest relationship with Abraham, you know? Um, the Last Supper, they're all sitting around, and there's John, the beloved disciple, and where is he? He's leaning back on Jesus' bosom. Well, it, they, they're, they're on these sort of bench jobbies, and they've all got their heads in towards the table and the feet out, because keeping the feet in those days away from the food was a great idea. Sandals, dirty feet, all that stuff. And uh, they're leaning on their left elbow. And you've only got to lean back to talk to your mate. You know, you confide, you trust, you're, you're close. It's that sort of idea it became a metaphor that meant you're in close, close relationship with. So there he is. Crack on, son. Uh, at the Father's side. Yeah, we did that, didn't we? The idea is of close proximity in table fellowship. And you only sat down at meals with people that, you know, you were happy to be close to and whatever, because that's the way it was in those days. This one then has come and made God known. That one, Echanos, that particular one, God, he has exegeted. It's from this Greek word here, exegesato, that we get our term exegesis. And what we mean by that is um, you take, we take a text of the Bible, for example, and we unpack what's in there. Well, a bit like what we're trying to do now. You unpack what's there to say what it says faithfully, you know? You get it with legal documents, you get it with all sorts of things, certainly with uh, literature and stuff. You certainly get it with scripture. It's the unpacking and the explaining of what lies in a text. It's not putting stuff in, that'll be asegesis, putting it into, and you don't you know there. There's plenty of people out there putting their own bright ideas into the book and trying to make it out like that's kosher. That's not kosher. That's not the thing to do. We're trying to see what's there, unpack what's there, get it out. And elsewhere in the New Testament, you find that word, it's an important word for us today. You find it uh, meaning tell the story, narrate the account, that sort of idea. And here what we've got is John saying that Jesus in the flesh, you know, came at Christmas, that sort of stuff, he is there to unpack God to us, to explain, to unpack, to narrate, to show, to demonstrate what's there in God. Jesus is the narration of God himself to us. But more than that, it's to make God known himself to us. What happens is Jesus shows us, demonstrates in his life and his teaching and everything else 
about him, what God is like, unpacks God to us, not simply that we should know about him, but that we should know him. So it's this whole disciple-discipleship thing, disciple-disciple-maker. Uh, do, do you see what I mean? You get to know about him, you get to know him. And in knowing him, you're transformed by him, because he's a transforming sort of personality, uh, and you follow him. Caleb. Made God known personally, he came to us. He came to us. It's a personal thing. He came to us personally as the embodiment, as the exposition of God, and he called for discipleship, following learning. There's different sorts of learning, aren't there? You know, there's, there's affective learning that teaches us how to feel about something or uh, makes us feel such and such about something. There's behavioural learning. It says you ought to be doing this. We know about that uh, sort of learning. Um, there's uh, cognitive learning. I understand more about. But the whole point is that it produces dispositional learning. All those things working together change our disposition, our outlook on the world and the way we react and relate and respond to the world. Did I say that too quickly? Stop me fast, I'm not making sense. Is it? Cushions. Eh? Throw cushions. No, don't throw cushions. You throw cushions, the dogs will jump on them. That's just not a good idea. They'll, they'll think it's to be hunted. Does that make sense? So he came to us personally as the embodiment of God to expound God to us. Revealing himself in principle, revealing himself in practice. We learn stuff from him and we learn how to be from him and how to respond from him. Personally he came to us revealing and revealing what of him. Thanks. What does he reveal? You look at him and you see what he's like and he's the <laughs> Don't, don't misunderstand, I'm not meaning to be irreverent here, but he's the finest guy you'll ever, you'll ever see. He's the finest guy you'll ever come across. You read and you understand what's making him tick. And he's, he's the finest of guys. And his holiness reveals my sinfulness. Because he's all I should be and I'm not managing to be. I learned that from him, he reveals that to me. To be honest. His sufficiency for whatever comes reveals to me my utter dependency of nature. Because they throw some terrible things at him and he deals with it remarkably. I don't. He reveals the reality of my creatureliness in his creatorhood. Because the things that people come up against time and again, you know, debilitating illness, things that people can't handle, things that people can't deal with, sorry, I just looked at you and I don't know why, um, but you know, it's stuff we can't handle, right? We've got plenty of our congregation at the moment with stuff we can't handle going on, yeah? And Jesus meets people like that and he fixes it. His creatorhood, his ability to rule his creation reveals to me my dependency and my, crea my creatureliness. Time and again, reveals my need in one way after another and his sufficiency to meet it. Thanks, Caleb. Revealing to me then how to stand in a world like this, how to live in a world like this, and how to live in right relationship to God, and in right relationship to the world that he's made for us to live in. <coughs> like this, in knowing the Creator, thanks Caleb, we understand whatever else has been made. So kids come home from school with a project for design and technology. And uh, they don't come on with a project that says, study the vacuum cleaner. They come on with a project that says, find out about James Dyson. Yeah? Because that way you learn about design. It's, it's a personal thing. In learning about the person, you're supposed to grasp more about design and creation and, yeah? Like that. And this is the deal. We get to know him and we understand what he's created better and we understand how to live in it better. That's the picture. So, Caleb, I should say conclusion now, which means we're getting perilously close to coffee and mince pies and things. 
things of that sort. You're going to read to the end, and so I always read the question to the end. Is that personal aspect of discovery and learning him that is critical? Just as it's much more fruitful to learn about James Dyson than it is to learn about vacuum cleaners. And, and, and just as that is just part of part of the story, so much more important to know him. And getting to know God in him through hearing him and seeing him and then following him because we've picked him up from the book. Now we don't have him walk, well we do to some extent, but not in the same way, the way he walked around Galilee, we don't have that. But John is going to tell us all about him. John's gospel is fantastic like that, to, to, to show you Jesus. This is what he is like, this is what he's about, so it makes him tick. It's great like that. Learning God as Jesus Christ's life expounds God to us. As Jesus Christ's teaching expounds God to us. Meeting with him in the process. And the challenge for us as a church through the things we've known this year and the things we anticipate for next year is to know him through following him and in doing so ourselves to follow him in his task of making God known making God known. We've discussed, and others of us will discuss, all sorts of stunts and tricks we've got up our sleeves for, for being able to, to show God and, and, and to show Christ to people through the coming year. Um, one of the things, I, I emailed a link to Tom the other day because I knew he was sitting at home. I thought, let's try this on Tom because he's a you know, go-ahead, dynamic individual, is Tom. I know he sits there looking like he's not, right? But he's said screwed on. He's going somewhere, Tom. I so I thought, I'll just, just try this on Tom, yeah? So I sent him this link, and you know, there are people, there are people in America who have sussed out how to do exactly what I thought, oh, I'd love to do that. Um, everybody's got a phone. And a few times with guys in the mart, farmers around the place or whatever, they've been chatting about spiritual stuff. And I said, listen, you know, don't, don't take it from me. You take God at his word, you go, I'll put this app on your phone for you. Oh, well, what's, what's that then, you know? Well, you take this finger, right, and you tap on that thing there, you know, it's great, isn't it? And up comes Mark's Gospel, John's Gospel, whatever. On, on, and I can Bluetooth stuff across or I can download an app for them or I can put a micro SD card in the back of their phone and wherever they are the wife doesn't even know what they're doing you know it's better that way isn't it um, they can sort of tap on something and there it is I've, I've got the Jesus film on this phone can you believe that isn't that amazing well I'm going to show you so <laughs> not now but um, you know that's phenomenal these guys, um, we haven't got Wi-Fi around here, have we? So you're trying to Wi-Fi something to somebody, download an app for people, or whatever. For $50, they reckon, somebody like Caleb, right, can build a box, which sets up its own little Wi-Fi in a place. So you've got an in infranet, is that right? Yeah. How phenomenal is that? Guys, do you, you know, back, <laughs> of, back of the landy, right? Plugged in, 12 volt setup, bosh. You know, there you go, boys. Hey, have one of these. Look, here's David Suchet reading don't mask gospel or something. There you go, have a listen to that. Fantastic. Come back with questions, that's fine. We'll have a natter, a cup of tea, you know. Wow. The world's your jolly oyster. But the point for us is that pick up this challenge that Jesus Christ came into the world to expound, to exegete God to people so that we might know him in his personality, in his essence, at the centre of his being. And to follow him means to carry on that process yourself. Okay, so this is the end of a series, and, and you know, some of us have lived through that, and some of us haven't, but, but there it is, it's all on the internet. Um, the oh, it's going to be on phones near you shortly, I think. We're going we're gonna to convert those files into the right sort of thing for phones, so they're small, and you know, amazing. Get these every week, guys. Up it goes. In this prologue, the emphasis is on the revelation of the word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him everything was made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life. And that life was the light of men. Here's the winding up to that introductory bit of the prologue. Here's the, the end of the brackets, if you like, the sort of the balance of the inclusio. The emphasis of the prologue is on the revelation of the word as the ultimate disclosure of God himself. Jesus is the ultimate unpacking of deity to us. Look at him. The being and nature of God, which can't be perceived directly from the ordinary senses, no more than you can see the x-rays that come off the sun. It has to be shown to you by special means. Jesus is that special means. 
and it's been adequately presented to us by the what we call the incarnation Christmas stuff and John gives us the record of the revelation of this Jesus who reveals God to us John's point is to do that so that you can know him so that you can believe in him and that, as he says in chapter 20 verse 28 and by believing have life in his name so if you want to know who God is more than that if you want to know him John's gospel is really the place to go it's John's point and purpose it's the place to read about him it's the place to meet with him as he comes to us in Jesus as Jesus unpacks the reality and it's that personal aspect of discovery and learning him that is critical you get to know God in him through following him and the life and words of Jesus then are more than an announcement they are an explanation an explanation by way of demonstration that make an introduction um, you, you get books like um, you know um, an, inst an introduction to string theory or something right yeah you do all the work <laughs> but then you go to a, a, a sort of a, a social something around Christmas or whatever and you're given an introduction to somebody Mandy I'd like you to meet Andrew yeah and it's been done I know um, so the work is done for you but now you know somebody that's the point of this and the challenge for us as a church through the things we've known the things we anticipate is to know him through following him through those things and in doing so ourselves to follow him in making God known So there's what it's about. There's the point of it. No one's ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, is in closest relationship with the Father, that Jesus has made him known. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him, through knowing him, as Jesus unfolds him to us.